We're in a series called Long Story Short. This is the second to last week. Pastor Aaron will return next week to kind of wrap all of this up. He's been on some vacation with his family, some much needed vacation away. And, and I haven't heard from him at all. And I haven't bugged him at all either. So just a little word to the wise. If you have a, a supervisor on vacation, leave them be, okay? Um, that's just uh, has nothing to do with the message. Uh, but we're doing this long story short, and, and we haven't gone verse by verse. Instead, we've been looking at overarching themes and, and pivot points, as I call it, in Scripture. These, these pivotal stories and these pivotal moments that help shape uh, people into who they were supposed to be. It helped understand who God is and why that mattered. And uh, what we've made it to the New Testament, finally, the last couple weeks, and we talked about atonement through the resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we talked about some common things in the teachings of Jesus and why that mattered to us. And today, I want to dive into the book of Acts. And, and now, remember, as we've been doing this, there have been some common themes throughout all of this as well. And throughout the Bible, when you read, you can understand, you can see these themes of covenant, which is this relationship this promise that God makes with creation and with people, and then kingdom, which is once we have this covenant, there's responsibility applied to us. Covenant and kingdom have been woven all throughout that. Now, before we get into Acts, I want to tail the very end of Matthew. I'm going to kind of paint this picture here because this is after the resurrection. This is Jesus before he is ascended. He is talking to his disciples, and he says this. And this is often called the Great Commission. He says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I I emphasize the word all in this because this three-letter word, in this passage dictates that Jesus' mission is no longer for just a nation and no longer for a particular people, but for all nations. And with that word, all of the covenant language that we've heard and we've seen about leading up to that point meets a pivot point. And these covenants, they they have to change. They have to adapt. Uh, I have to apologize to you because when I use technology like this, something pops up on occasion. Anybody ever do that? There we go. Wow, what a, okay, I'm never going to talk about, hey, it could be worse, right? Because it happens. Where was I? This covenant had to be reimagined and re-explained. And and you start to see that through this book that we call Acts, A-C-T-S. Your Bible might call it the Acts of the Apostles. And it is essentially the 30 years, what happened to the beginning of the church and those early followers for the 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. And here's what we know about the story of Acts. What we know is is the faith, the Christian faith, it, it wasn't called Christian at first, but we know that the faith explodes as hundreds and eventually thousands of people within Judea, they start to embrace this message of Jesus. And that's just within the first couple months. And another thing that shouldn't surprise you, but we know this, that the early church, those early believers, their faith had a lot of Jewish undertones to it. And they started to mix and they started to match the old things that they knew, the old covenants they knew with the new things that Jesus has taught. They, they mixed uh, their old laws with these new things that Jesus said that I give you a new command. They try to put those together and mix and match. What I mean is, is things like this. They would look back to what Moses said, and Moses gave the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, as I call them. But then there's these other laws as well. There's civil laws, there are rules to live by, and there are dietary laws, all of those things. But then Jesus came along, and he says, you know what, I'm here to fulfill the law. I'm here to fulfill the old covenant that God made with Israel, and I'm establishing a brand new covenant into the world. And that's really good news. But for those early believers in Jesus, the Jewish men and women, their faith was hardwired and and, and completely attached to the Old Testament. And Now, they don't call it old, by the way. It wasn't an Old Testament to them. It was just their scripture. Often it was referred to as the Law and the Prophets, but that's what they were connected to. It was their Bible. They had been raised to believe certain things and to behave certain ways, and it became very hard for many of them to break away from that older covenant thinking. But eventually, they did break away. 
from those habits, and eventually they broke away from other things and from certain beliefs. And because of that, we are here today. Now, you can see this struggle of accepting a new covenant uh, all the way through the book of Acts. But since this is long story short, I'm going to give you one snapshot, one story of an encounter by Jesus' disciple by the name of Peter. Peter had become the rock. He is the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he was also raised Jewish. So he, he, like many other Jewish Christians around Judea, were still clinging to God's covenant that they grew up with because they didn't know anything different. They were trying to understand that and to mash it up with what the new things that Jesus had taught. And so God arranged an intervention for Peter. And here's how it happened. Peter is visiting a friend in the town of Joppa. And Joppa is right on the Mediterranean Sea. And he's there at the house. It's probably around noon or, or, you know, lunchtime, essentially. And he decides to go up on the roof where there is a beautiful view. There's, there's breezes coming in off the Mediterranean. He could smell lunch cooking. And um, if you are like me, I go home after church and, and I smell lunch cooking sometimes. And, and, but in the middle of it, what do I do? I take a nap. Anybody else take Sunday naps? man, there should be like 11th commandment, thou shalt take a nap on Sundays. But he's taking a nap, it's relaxing, and as he's sleeping, he has this dream. And in the dream, he sees all sorts of animals that Jewish men, women, they were not allowed to touch, they were not allowed to hunt, they weren't allowed to kill, they certainly weren't allowed to eat them. And in this dream, he heard a voice that says, kill them, cook them, eat them, you know, basically that's what it says. And in the dream, this, speak, this voice speaks so loud to him, and it turns out to be Jesus, that, that Peter says back to the voice, he says, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Essentially he's saying, okay, uh, your law says this. Your word says this. If he had a Bible at the time, he probably would have flipped it open to a particular verse and quoted it to say, my Bible and my scripture say you're not supposed to touch those animals and you're certainly not supposed to eat them. I, I never have and I never will. Is that okay with you, Lord? <laughs> but what he sees doesn't make sense to him. And then the voice says to him, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And for many of us Protestants, we look back to this and we say, oh, we, we love this part because, because of this story, we have bacon. <laughs> or at least we get to eat bacon. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this is confusing because since Peter was a child, the scripture had taught him that these animals were off limits. They, you weren't supposed to have anything to do with it. And so when you read these sorts of things, looking back to the Old Testament, and I imagine Peter thinking the same thing, is what happened? Did God change his mind? Did God all of a sudden change who he was? And, and this is the part that conflicts. If you were raised in the church and, and you've got Old Testament stuff and New Testament stuff, the question is, did God change? And, and the answer is no. God's covenant changes. The first covenant was over. The first covenant from God was to establish this nation of Israel for a particular purpose. And that covenant ends whenever Jesus shows up himself and helps us to fully understand who God is and what we're called to be. And the end of that covenant had come. But for Jewish Christians in Judea, it was just so hard for them to fully understand that and to not mix and match their old covenant and their new covenants. But as soon as the vision was over, there was a knock at the door. Somebody yells upstairs, Peter, there is somebody here to speak to you. And so he goes downstairs, and there at the door is a man, there's a soldier, and they say to him, we have come, and we want you to come to the house of Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion, and he has invited you to his house because he has heard the details of the story of Jesus, and he wants to know more. He wants to know from you, the person who was there and saw it all. We've heard bits and pieces, but please come share the rest with us. So he has the dream. All of a sudden, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person is there. And now here's what you need to know. Before this day, Peter, like any other good Jewish person, would never have stepped foot inside a Gentile's home. Why? Because the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, they were clear. Don't contaminate yourself with Gentiles. 
don't do it. You don't want to get Gentile cooties, so don't you dare go into their house. And so Jews would not cross the threshold of the door. They would never go inside. But Peter has this dream, and now he's being invited to do just that. And so Peter grabs a few of his Jewish Christian brothers and friends with him, and they go on their way to Cornelius' house, and he gets there, and I bet he's probably nervous, he's sweating bullets, um, he's probably standing there at the door, and before he knocks, he's probably like, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. you guys go first. <laughs> That's probably what he's thinking. But they go in. They go into this house, and, and you can tell that uh, he, he's a little bit scared. You can tell the vision that he had was freaking him out a little bit, and that this was just so hard. And Peter is, is saying things like this, this feels so strange, and this feels so wrong. But as he steps across the threshold, he gets inside the room, you know what it's full of? It's full of Gentiles. A bunch of them. There's Cornelius, the Roman centurion. There's his wife. There's his children. There's servants. There's soldiers. All of them. Dirty, unclean, Gentiles. And Peter can't help but be uncomfortable and nervous. Which explains why whenever he opens up his mouth, he says something that's pretty offensive when you really read it. This is what he says. You know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this, or to associate with you. So imagine you've invited somebody you've never met into your house, and they step in the door, and the first thing they say is, well, you know it's against my religion to actually have anything to do with you. Wouldn't that be nice? That's essentially what Peter's doing. I shouldn't be here. This is not my idea, because his law, the Jewish law, it was exclusive. It was excluding, and everybody knew that. It was designed that way for God, by God for a purpose, but now he's calling Peter to get ready and to change all of that. And then the very next line gets even worse. Peter continues on. He says, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. In other words, until yesterday. Or until just now, I considered all of you impure and unclean, you dirty heathens, right? I considered you all of this because my scripture says that I can't go into your house because God's people are holy people and we are above you and we are set apart. We don't eat your food and we don't drink your water and we don't marry your women and we don't dance to your music and we don't wear your clothes. We don't do any of that. But then Peter says something earth shattering. He says, but I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. No favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and those that do right. In other words, after he has said all of this stuff, basically condemning them, he says, but I now realize that God has really thrown the doors open to everyone, especially you. And that's not what the Jews had done all up to that point. But it's this new thing, this new covenant that God is doing. Now, you and I, if our background as Christians in our 21st century, we look back on this and we can think, well, well, this is so intuitive. Of course, God loves everybody, right? We say that. God is love. God loves everybody, and we believe that God welcomes everybody, but we need to be clear. This is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that God loves everybody. The New Covenant teaches that God loves everybody. The New Testament, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament teaches that God mostly loves the Jews, even though sometimes he gets irritated with the Jews. There are two incompatible covenants in this. One is a means to the other, but the other one gets you here. But at some point, you've got to be able to say, it's time to let the old one go. And that was the struggle then and the struggle now. Now, the story continues because Peter then starts to do what they've asked him to do. Remember, they asked him to come to give the details, to share the story of this guy, Jesus, that they've heard all about. And he starts to tell this story, and, and like any good pastor, he's there, he's got this big conclusion, this altar call, whatever it is. Before he gets to it, something weird starts to happen in the room that's beyond his control. It's the same thing that happened to him and the other disciples about 10 years earlier. Ten years earlier, whenever they were in this upper room, 
And a rush of a mighty wind came in, and the Holy Spirit made contact. And they went out, and they were able to speak languages that they had never uh, spoken before. That Holy Spirit, that thing that happened 10 years ago, all of a sudden happened now. And these people, these Gentiles, these ones that up until hours earlier were not welcome, are all of a sudden speaking in tongues. And suddenly, these Gentiles in the room, they had the same experience and Peter and the people with them they couldn't believe it in fact look at their reaction it says the Jewish believers who had come with Peter they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on these Gentiles they were astonished which meant they still thought that the Holy Spirit was just for them the Jewish people and God blew their mind and again we say of course the Holy Spirit's available to everybody but under their covenant God drew a circle around his people and he says, you are to not be like your neighbors. You are to be separate. You are to be different. You are to be set apart and new. You, you don't need to get Gentile cooties. And if you do, oh, shame on you. So this experience happens, and their world is being turned upside down. And these Jewish Christians with Peter, they head back to Jerusalem. And as they're there, they're, they're telling people. They, it's like they go to church, and they're like, hey, I want to tell you exactly what happened. It was amazing. But then the people that heard them speak said, did this. It says, but when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You never criticize a pastor, do you? Ooh, that's quiet. Okay. Criticize them. You entered into a home of Gentiles, and you ate with them. Remember Pastor Trey talking about the idea that when you eat with somebody, it is a connection. It's a reconciliation. It's you no longer can be enemies. They're like, and you ate with them. The Jewish Christians, the mix and match Christians at that time, like you ate with them. Uh, you, you need to get out. You, you, you need to go be in quarantine. <laughs> Wear more than a mask. I mean, you need to go away. And when you hear that, again, you're like, what's up with these people? Well, what's up with them is they understood what we call the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, in ways that we can't. And they're mixing, and they're matching these covenants, and eventually they would find out that that's a little bit dangerous to do. So, so the big question is this. What, what does this story have anything to do with us? I mean, we're over all of that, aren't we, right? Everybody's welcome. God loves everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Those first century Jews, they just had to make the transition. But we, we're good, right? Well, here's the thing is we're not completely good. And here's why. One of the problems of current church culture and current Christians is our propensity to mix and match old covenants and new covenants. God's covenant with Israel, with a nation. And Jesus' new covenant with the whole world. Churches do this all the time. Preachers do this all the time. And if you're a Bible-reading person, which I hope you are, you will do it as well. We have the tendency to try to make one fit into the other and have them make sense. Our brains are wired to actually create, see patterns, and fill them and fix them. And so we mix and we match things so that hopefully they can make sense to us, but they just can't. We do it all the time. I understand why we do it. I was raised doing it. Maybe you do it because of the way you got your first Bible and somebody who explained the Bible to you. Maybe uh, you were a kid, maybe you were an adult, and, and somebody gave you a Bible uh, and said, here you go, read this whole thing. But they didn't tell you that this incredible book is actually many, many books broken into two different sections, two different covenants, an old covenant and a new covenant. And if you want to understand the heart of God, look in the new covenant. Look at Jesus. And then when you get to understand Jesus, read the old covenant. Because then you'll be able to start to see glimpses of Jesus all throughout it. Nobody did that for you. And so you picked up your Bible and you started from the beginning. And you read all of these laws. And then you got to Jesus. And by then you thought, okay, those are still in place. How do I make Jesus fit them? That's what happens time after time again. You may be saying, Ben, are you telling me? That the two covenants of the Bible, that they conflict. Well, yeah, they do. And I learned that from the stories of Peter. I learned that from Paul. I learned that from Jesus' brother, James. I learned that from Jesus himself, who time after time said, you have heard it said this way, but now I am telling you something new. 
Jesus, who, who says, I've come, I fulfilled that covenant, and we're, I've landed the plane on that one, and now we're going to take off with a brand new one. And this time, it's not just for you or for a nation, it's for the whole world. Have you ever heard preachers that rant and rant about sin? It, it almost seems like they are happy to rant about sin and happy to talk about hell. I was raised in that. You know what that is? That is old covenant thinking, leading it, leaching in to your new covenant theology. It is mixing and matching. That is the old covenant prophet railing against the nation of Israel. God is going to judge you, and God is going to get you, and God is going to stop you. That is Old Testament. That is Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, you know what we discover, especially about sin? God doesn't hate you because of sin. Sin doesn't make God angry with you. Sin breaks God's heart because sin breaks people, and he knows this. And God so loved the world, it said, that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He wants us to have an eternal and a full life, and he knows that sin destroys that for us. It breaks us, and so it breaks God's heart. And so I got some good news for you. And this comes from the very end of the book of Acts. 28th chapter ends with the Apostle Paul now at home, probably for a few years. He can't travel like he used to. Um, but he's there, and people come, they see him. He, he's kind of a, a rock star in the faith. And, and so people come, and he tells story after story. He would constantly tell all of his stories. Kind of like when I go visit my dad, who's in his mid-70s, tells me the same stories year after year, day after day. And you know what I do? Wow. So listen, if your grandpa or your parents keep telling you the same story, appreciate it. Because it might not be there much longer. But this is where Paul is at, and he's there, and, and he's telling everybody he can, especially these Jewish people, the story, and some of them believe. But most of them don't. And so Paul, at the very end of this chapter, he reminds us that of the words of the prophet Isaiah that were spoken hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. He says to those people who came and listened and refused to believe, he said, those people, they have eyes, but they just are unwilling to see. They have ears, but they are unwilling to hear. And they have hearts that they are unwilling to open. And he says, because they refused, though, Paul wanted everybody to know the good news. He says, because of that, listen. He says, so I want you to know that the salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. The, those people that, that weren't raised with the covenant, the old covenant. The people that didn't understand the rules. The people that honestly didn't even have the new covenant. Because this wasn't around whenever this faith first started out. No, those people, they started to believe it. They accepted it. Because when they understood and they heard the story and they accepted the reality that Jesus died, that he said he was going to die, that he did, that he rose again like he said he would, that his Holy Spirit showed up and has guided people for decades. When they heard that story, they believed in him. Because anybody who predicts their death and dies and raises again, you follow that person. And that's what they did. You start with Jesus. And because of that, we are here. So the book of Acts, it began describing the events of the earlier followers of Jesus. It tells of the struggles that they had with their heritage, their old way of faith, and their new. It's a story of Jesus doing what Jesus always does throughout the stories, turning things upside down, upsetting the status quo, making things new, and throughout the lines of the story, you start to see this amazing love of a God extending his kingdom and his covenant beyond a person like Abraham and beyond a nation of Israel, but out to the whole world. And that is some good news for you. Here, the old covenant, you just need to know, is not your covenant. Yours is better. Yours is practically irresistible, but our world won't understand that until we do, until we embrace it, until we, like Peter and the Apostle Paul and others, we, we let go of the old and fully embrace the new that Jesus came to unleash in the world. Your covenant 
is practically irresistible because it's simple. It's not based on 600 and some laws. It's this simple. God loves you so much that he spent hundreds and hundreds of years trying to help you understand who he was. And then eventually he got the world ready so that one person can come into this world and fully illuminate who God was and who God, what, who God calls you to be. And all he requires of you is not to accept 10 different things. It's one thing. That is to acknowledge what he's done. And then live that out as best you can. That you would acknowledge who Jesus is. And say, yes. Yes, Jesus, this covenant I want with you. And then take responsibility and live that out in this kingdom. And I hope that is just um, disturbing enough or intriguing enough to have you come back next week. And see where we land the plane, so to speak. We wrap up the end of this long story short. And so to finish this up, just know, today, this is the good news. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You just bow your head with me and take a breath. And I just ask God that you come, that you... Meet us in the places that we feel a little uncomfortable today. God, that you help us to engage with your book in very intellectual ways, but yet very deep emotional, spiritual ways. Help us to see where we may have mixed and matched. And and because of that, we have excluded people from you. Forgive us, Lord. When we use these rules to attack others and to weaponize against those who think differently. Forgive us. And then God, I pray that you help us to say again or for the very first time, yes. Jesus, I acknowledge you are the son of God, yes. Jesus, help me to live out this new covenant that you demanded, this this new covenant that says we are to love others as you have loved us. Give us the power, Lord. And make us new. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to all who have heard this. May it resonate in them so that when they leave this moment, it somehow makes them different. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us through the rest of our worship. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.